Good morning. Redheaded lady, take your seat. <laughs> That's good to see everybody, Butch. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're doing okay. It's good to see you, sir. But let's uh, close our minds and just open our hearts, and we'll just have to see what the Lord takes us today. Lord, we're grateful for today and every day that you bless us with. Lord, we we'll just pray that you're with the people who can't be with us today. And if it's uh, an illness, we just pray that they get better and that we're able to uh, just get together again next week and and just fellowship before, after service and all times during the week. And we just pray that everybody's doing okay today. And we're just anxious to hear what the word of George is today. And we're just anxious to listen to him and and I'm uh, just glad everybody's open. Just, I know what I'm trying to say, but, and then you know what I'm trying to say. I just can't get the words together. But I want to thank you for today and every day that you bless us with. And we want to say thank you. Amen. Just wanted to let everyone know that Zach's not suddenly become a heathen. He hurt his knee yesterday. And if you could keep him in your prayers this morning, we would both really appreciate that. If you'd all please stand, we'll worship God together. As long as, as, long as the piano works. Here we go.
Children are dismissed. Is it my turn? It is your turn. <laughs> <laughs> I do, if I could use that. Thank you. I never know what's a sacred cow and what isn't, so I never. <laughs> Good morning. You've been on an adventure. For how long have you been without a pastor? Five years? I've had several churches that we've, at the same time, and I've, I'm like, Lord, I'm going to get something mixed up some Sunday. I'm supposed to be here. Wayne's supposed to be there. Another pastor over here. Another. I'm going to get it mixed up. Um, I've had, like many of you, an interesting week. Uh, and the enemy seems to use some little things and sometimes some big things. I just uh, I found out a young man uh, some years ago, in fact, I did wedding counseling and their marriage and he fell and uh, he's only mid 40s I think fell in a store and hit his head and he's in heaven um, his service will be this coming Friday um, and little things <laughs> my, my Friday I get a text and like where are you I was supposed to be in an Eagle Summit meeting that I thought was next Friday so I had to race to that and any of you any of you men have the the uh, cans that warm up your shaving cream every once in a while I'll treat myself to that well I, I plugged that in I went upstairs and did some stuff with the dogs came back down and for some reason it emptied the whole can into my <laughs> it was too tight or something and then I've lost my keys um, a set of keys they're not that important it's just the front door key to Valley Christian and <laughs> my classroom key and my <laughs> It's like, Lord, all these crazy little things that pile up, it's well with my soul. <laughs> and we have nothing to complain about. If I'm not mistaken, the author of that song was the one who wrote that after it was his wife and his daughters died at sea, a ship that sunk, and he could still write, it's well with my soul. And lots of times we look at all the stuff going on, and when we think about it in light of eternity... It's not even a drop in the bucket. It doesn't matter. Um, I had told my wife, or my wife, yeah, I wish I could. <laughs> my daughter, um, yesterday she asked me how I was feeling. I said, I'm doing okay. As I, some of you got the chest cold and head cold thing going on too. She says, why don't you just call and cancel? I said, I can't. I, can't. <laughs> I don't feel that bad. So I took a couple Advil, and you know, some of you did that this morning too, right? <laughs> so we're here trying to learn... Some things the Lord might have for us. John chapter 10, if you've got your Bible handy, let me read a few verses here. John 10, because we are definitely compared with sheep, and there's some reasons for that. Um, the church body is compared as a flock to sheep, and I hope you desire to be a, a healthy sheep in the flock, in a healthy flock. Uh, what are some qualities that are some things that are involved in that? John <coughs> chapter 10, <coughs> verse 7. If I lose my voice, uh, let's see who gets to take. You get to take over. <clears throat> okay, is that agreed? No, he he's just laughing. Okay. <clears throat> uh, John 10, 7. Then Jesus said to them again. And did I just do that? <laughs> Hello. Well, let me see if the technology can work here. <laughs> there we go. I was just telling a couple people earlier, Lord, what happens if everything I have planned, nothing works? <laughs> and I've always wondered, what, okay, what will I do? And I have been in situations where I had to change everything instantly. So um, just see what the Lord does here. Then Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to do what? To steal, to kill, and to destroy. And that's Satan. 
I've come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. I'm out of here. (laughs) And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. I'm the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and am known by my sheep. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep have, I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. <clears throat> and I think it's important, in fact, um, the little church in Dusty that we're helping also near Colfax their pastor resigned, and so there we went through a couple Sundays of what the biblical principles regarding a shepherd, and then some principles regarding sheep. Uh, what are, how are we to, to follow that? And we know that sheep do follow each other. In fact, you get one to go one direction, the others will go two. If one sheep moves, the whole flock will move, so they do desire to stay together. And they'll move toward another sheep or a friend. They actually see the shepherd as a friend. Uh, and that's their instinct to stay close together. And um, so sometimes the shepherds will kind of exploit that instinct just because they like to stay close together. So they can move from the barn to the pasture uh, through that process. And the secret is to allow the sheep that come to them, often they'll just feed by hand, give some grain to the sheep and, and uh, gain their confidence. And so they'll, soon they'll figure out that um, they, that's the person they need to follow. So just some, some quick thoughts here, um, some principles, some things that we should consider. Some basics. Are you born again? Are you baptized and obedient? The, to be a healthy sheep, part of the flock. Um, are you in a growing relationship with God? And in character, are you becoming more like Christ? Um, and... Is there a love for other saints, for other sheep? Because sometimes that can be an issue. Is there a servant's heart? Do you have a servant's heart? And do you trust the shepherd? Are you willing to follow the shepherd? Now, we know that we can carry the analogy too far. We just need to be careful with that, too. But the, the ultimate shepherd's the Lord himself. But an earthly shepherd, that's what a pastor is. That's what the word means. It's shepherd. He's a shepherd of the flock. Um, and the idea here, too, of being born again, in fact, we remember John chapter 1, verse 29, when John saw Jesus coming, those were his words. Look, there's the Lamb of God. So that image right away, uh, with Christ as, as a sheep, as the Lamb, was, was clearly given, and the idea was that um, he takes away, what was that lamb? What was the lamb there for? To take away the sin of the world. That was the purpose of the lamb, the lamb's death. That was the Old Testament sacrificial system was all based on that. And you notice in the t- tabernacle, there's only one entrance, only one way. In fact, Jesus said that, I am the way. He's, he's also the door. We just read that as well. But um, that idea of only one way was given right away in the Old Testament, and the Israelite people knew that. There's only one way in, and one way into that outer court, and then one way to the temple. Literally, the gate. Sometimes the shepherd, if this was an enclosed area where there were sheep, the shepherd would literally, his body would be the door. Nothing would get in, nothing would get out without going through him, literally, over him, by him. Um, That could be set up even with just some branches and bushes and to try and keep the sheep in. But that shepherd at times would be the one right there at the door. Uh, and those were, there are seven I am's in John. That was one of them. I am. In fact, that can go clear back to the Old Testament when Moses said, God, you want me to go to Pharaoh. Who do I say sent me? And remember what God said? Tell him, I am sent you. I am the eternal existent one. I am. Every time Jesus said that, he was alluding to the fact that he was God-man. He was not just an ordinary prophet. 
I am the bread of life. I am the way. I am the truth. Okay, and I, I am the gate. Uh, and we know this stems back, the whole idea of the sacrifice stems back to when Adam and Eve sinned. Uh, <laughs> one rule. God said one thing not to do. When you see a wet paint sign, what do you want to do? <laughs> Why is that? And are there any teenagers here today? Well, you, you know, you, how many of you were teenagers at one point in your life? Yeah. No, and we have a couple who were never teenagers. When your parents said, don't do that, what did you want to do? <laughs> Why is that? When the teacher says, don't do that, what do you want to do? It's, it's something in our nature. We, want, we tend to want to test. Not everyone's like that, but we tend to. They sinned. They did exactly what... They were told not to do. They understood what guilt was, and we all understand that. We know. In fact, if we're just um, chemical responses and electrical impulses, what is this thing called sin? What's the deal with guilt? In fact, you guys are really the problem. If you would just shut your mouths about this sin thing, you're just trying to make people feel guilty. Because there really is no such thing. Is it wrong for a lion to kill an antelope? Is that a sin? See, we're just animals, right? And there are people who believe that. The, and it's like I've told my, my Bible class at Valley Christian High School class there, they... I said, there are people now, that's a growing number, who don't dislike you. They hate you. They hate what you say. They hate what you stand for. They hate the message of the gospel. You may not think that's true, but I'm telling you, it's a growing number of people who's not dislike, it's hatred. If they could get rid of you, they would. That's why we need to find, ask God and God's Spirit to give us creative ways to even start asking questions, to give an answer to those who ask you of the hope that's in you. And are we living the lives we should live? We know from that very beginning there was a high price that, that was paid for sin, an innocent animal. We don't know for sure it was a sheep, but uh, there was an innocent animal that lost its life to cover Adam and Eve, to cover them. God made garments of skin. And he clothed them there, Genesis chapter 3. And there is that picture. Jesus did become the final sacrifice, as John mentioned there in, in John chapter 1. And the stamp, the uh, verification, what was that? It's the empty tomb. Okay? That empty tomb was verification that Jesus is who he said he was. And there are those who say that didn't actually happen. Um, Jesus in the coolness of the tomb revived. I'm like, well, okay, there'd be some other miracles involved then. Do you know anyone who's lived who's been stabbed in the heart? And that's what that Roman soldier did. And these, remember, Roman soldiers were, life and death meant nothing to them. These are the same kind of guys who could go to Bethlehem and slaughter two-year-old babies. Heartless. That Roman soldier didn't just well, let's test and see if he's alive. No, you, you understand the process. And Scripture says blood and water came out. If Jesus survived being stabbed in the heart, I would count that as a miracle. If he revived in the tomb after being stabbed in the heart. And there are other issues too. You can, people can think that through. But um, the whole point is, do you know that you're born again? Um, good friends of mine... Um, young couple married. In fact, we attended each other's weddings. Very, we've known each other for many, many years. Uh, Peggy, attending Bible college, they were married, headed into ministry. She'd been in Bible college for at least a year. She came to realize she'd never really accepted Christ as Savior. I talked to her the other day to verify what I had remembered she had told my wife, and that's, that was true. She, she was in Bible college, and the Lord convicted her that she... Accepting Christ is not just words, is it? It's not just praying some prayer. It, it's, it's from our spirit, our heart. We use the word heart. We're not talking about the pumper muscle. 
Um, I find, found it interesting the Greeks used to use the liver as the seat of emotions. We use the word heart. And I always thought, I joke with kids, I said, yeah, if you were dating, you, a guy might say to his young lady friend, if he was Greek, you make my liver quiver. <laughs> you, you know, we could come up with, and, and there were other seats of emotions depending on culture and time, but when we're talking about the heart, we're talking about the real you, um, the essence of who you are, that part of you that's God conscious, that part of you that an animal does not have. The, the, the real you. Have you received Christ, accepted him as your personal savior? We have another, another friend. Um, well, he was a friend at the time. In fact, we, this was, I think I can tell you, Redondo Beach, California. We were in ministry there, really neat ministry God allowed us to be part of. Um, this man was, he owned the second largest realty company in the United States. The auditorium stated about 300. I worked with Pastor Bill Kellogg. We served together, and this particular man and his wife, every Sunday in about 300-seat auditorium, sat on the right side back about three-quarters of the way. Like some of you have your own seats, you got your name on them. No, nobody better sit in that seat. Or <laughs> One Sunday in the little church, I put the slide up and said, do something wild and crazy, sit somewhere different. <laughs> nope. <laughs> I'm not doing it. <laughs> But they sat in the same place every Sunday. In fact, he'd been an officer in the church. I got a call from his secretary one day and said they thought his wife was attempting suicide. So I took a friend with me, a staff friend, and got to her condo, and the um, door was locked, pound on the door, no response. Got the manager, opened it up, and went into her bedroom, and I, I just assumed she was gone. And I tried to go out and see in the kitchen what she did. She had alcohol and some medication that she'd taken. Well, my friend in the room was able to wake her up. We got coffee down her and started talking to her. That was not Al's wife. That was one of his girlfriends. We didn't, the pastor, Bill, myself, no one knew. Everyone thought that was his wife. And she was attempting suicide because Al was dating another person on the Redondo Beach Police Force, and he wouldn't divorce his recluse wife that none of us knew. I don't know for certain, but by your fruit, Scripture says, you'll know them. I don't know if Al really knew Christ as Savior. I'll let you think that one through. I, and again, I'm not God, but there was not evidence that his life had changed, that there was a difference. And he was hiding a lot, of, a lot of sin, a lot of things. He didn't want other people to know. Are you certain? Can you look back to a time? Maybe you don't remember the date. I happen to, in fact, I tease people and say, if you don't know the date, you're not really saved. I was saved July 27, 1958, just short of my 10th birthday. If you don't know exact date and exact time, you're not really a Christian. Is that true? We were able to go to Papua New Guinea years ago, and the language helper with us, Hete, I asked him how old he was. He said, I, I don't know, I think I'm 28. He didn't know when he was born. Does that mean he was never born? <laughs> of course not. <laughs> but uh, there ought to be some circumstances that, you, that lead up to a point in your life where you know, I recognize my sinfulness, and I, I believe what Christ did was for me, and I trust what he did for me on the cross. And, was, it's mine. I accept that. Um, when, you, when you truly have received Christ as Savior, behold that Lamb of God, John 3, 3, except a man be born again. Remember to Nicodemus, Jesus said that very clearly. Unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. In fact, do you remember Nicodemus' response? He said, you, you mean I have to go back into my mother's womb and be born a second time? And I almost imagine Jesus chuckling there going, Nick, you're, you're supposed to be smart. Of course I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about who you really are, your spirit. This is what we get mixed up. And I, I, I know this seems like a little thing, but I think it's a big thing. We say we're humans with a spirit and a soul. I say, no, the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches you are a spirit being with a soul and a temporary physical form. You are a spirit being 
When you die, for the believer, what's Paul say? Absent from the body, poof, present with the Lord. Do I understand that? Nope. Do I believe that? Yep. What do you believe? Is that true or is that a fairy tale? Is that true or just made up? Okay, and sometimes you see the little dude in the middle there, right? Sometimes there are those wolves in sheep's clothing. Sometimes there are those who appear to be believers, and they're really not. And uh, they, can, they can create some havoc. Okay? Uh, again, Isaiah 53, all we like sheep. What have we done? We've gone astray. We've turned our own ways. And the Lord laid on him all of our sin. In fact, the moment of the most agony on the cross when Christ hung there, and he said, Eloi, Eloi, Lamba Sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? At that moment, the sin of all mankind was on him, and God turned his back on his own son. And that's hard for us to imagine, hard for us to comprehend, but it was my sin, it was our sin that did that, uh, laid that burden on him. Secondly, baptized. There's a couple of these I'm going to go through quickly, so hang on, it won't be that long. <laughs> Well, maybe it will. I don't know. Hey, um, you're all familiar with Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. And the real question probably is, is the shepherd my Lord? Is the shepherd my Lord? And Lord, that term, in common terms for us, is boss. He's the master of my life. You've seen the sign, uh, God is my co-pilot. That's part of the problem. <laughs> He's supposed to be the pilot. We're supposed to be trusting in him. Why, why is baptism important? Because it's, it's modeled and commanded. Matthew 28, we won't take time to turn there, and I think you're well aware of that as well. In fact, the, the broadest sense of the term baptism means identification. It's used in the Old Testament as well with Moses. It's identification. A believer is identified with Christ through death, burial, resurrection, through immersion. That's what it's that's the picture. In fact, other forms of, of um, it, bap, what's called baptism um, don't follow that pattern, don't follow the picture. The, the word baptizo means to dip, to dunk, to immerse. Where I went to Bible college in southern Minnesota, a little town, Owatonna, Minnesota, um, there was a Greek coffee shop there. A fellow by, it was George's, just happened to be George's. <laughs> So I went in one day, I said, hey, George, what does the Greek word baptizo mean? He took a cup of coffee, and he took a donut, and he went. <laughs> he dunked the donut in the coffee. And I said, well, what does the word rontizo mean, which is a different Greek word? He laid a saucer down, he put the donut in the saucer, and he took the cup of coffee, and he poured it over the donut. <laughs> so it's very different. In fact, the... King James translators took the Greek word baptizo, they made a new English word, they anglicized the word and made baptism. So it could mean, di it could mean different things. And they knew full well what it meant to dip, to dunk, to immerse. They knew that, but they, uh, I had someone tell me that they, well, they, they knew that. I said, well, they were Church of England. They didn't do that. I, I, we know what they did, so. In fact, uh, John 14, also another area of obedience. If we, if we say we love the Lord, what will we do? We'll do what he asks and tells us to do. We'll obey. And that's kind of simple, but sometimes it's, it's hard. In fact, uh, Paul said this to be imitators of me just as I am of Christ. Now, no matter who comes here as pastor, no matter who the human is, there'll be things that you're going to see that you may struggle with. I struggle with sometimes with grammar from pulpits. I get it wrong too, but I know one lady, she felt as a sheep, it was her mission to correct every grammatical mistake her pastor made. And so after the service, she would hand him a sheet <laughs> where she had, you know, for every negative thing that a pastor hears, it's been said the experts, whoever these people are, say it takes 10 to 15 positive things to, to wipe away that, 10 to wipe away that hurt. It's easy to crush a person's spirit. Find ways to lift your pastor, your new pastor and his wife up. And it, it's a team. Remember that. It is a team. 
um, that God has called as well. But Paul said, be imitators of me just as I am of Christ. In James 1.22, that we're to be not just uh, hearers, don't just listen, but do. It's interesting, the Old Testament has no word for, for obey. There is one Hebrew word, shema, that means to hear. And it was understood that if you heard and understood, what would happen? You did it. And if it wanted to be emphasized in, in the Hebrew, it would, it would be, they'd use the word doubly, shema, shema. Okay, God just, in the Old Testament culture, the Jewish culture, if you heard, you did it. You heard, you understood, you obeyed. There was no, no question there. So um, that's something to consider as well. Are born again, are you obedient? Baptized, obedient. If you haven't been baptized yet, seek out. I don't know the process here, but throw you in the river, I guess. Does that work? Wait till it's about 34 degrees. And <laughs> okay. um, do you have a right and growing relationship with God? You can't see in there, but sometimes the, sh the goats get in there. They're hiding amongst the sheep. And... Uh, the whole point is, is that we grow, we're in a growing relationship with God as a sheep. Knowing God, loving God, serving God, that's another whole message in itself, but just let me say this. Sometimes we get that backwards. We think that serving is the emphasis. If I am doing what's right, notice we're not human doings. We are human beings. It's, are, am I in a right relationship with God? The more I know God, the more I will love God, and as an overflow of that love relationship, the more I'll serve God. It won't be, I have to do this. In fact, we can serve God, bring on the appearance of serving God, and certainly not have a right heart. We're just trying to impress people. Is that what God wants? No. He wants a right heart. And as, we, as we're growing in our relationship with God, um, that, that can develop. And John 1, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, God's faithful, God's just, he forgives. So are we in a right relationship with God? Are we in a right relationship with others? That's what a healthy sheep works at. It's easy to, to me, the easy part when we, when we sin, is this asking for forgiveness? Sorry, God. Is that asking for forgiveness? I challenge my students all the time with that. I said, don't do the meaningless instant. Sorry. Don't we tend to do that with God? Is that what confession is? If we confess our sin, we know what God's going to do. He's faithful. He's just. What does he do? He forgives. What is confession? That word confession means to say the same thing that God says about my sin. We're dealing with a situation now that's with, with a friend who's just... All sin is, is bad, but you do know f full well that some sin carries with it more consequences. And we're dealing with a situation that carries some pretty heavy consequences. And in fact, he, he wanted me to hold him accountable, and I found out he didn't really tell me the truth. Um, and I'm just, in the last two weeks, realized what was actually going on. And it is hard to be painfully honest about our sin. But what does God want us to do? The, and it's not just telling God, if I've sinned against someone else, I've sinned against my wife. What am I supposed to do? Tell God first, make it right vertically. Then I need to make things right with my wife. I had a call one Saturday night, Pastor. Can you come speak tomorrow morning? I've just had a terrible fight with my wife and I can't, I can't get in the pulpit. I was too think pleased that he had confidence enough to call us and, and to know that he couldn't get in the pulpit that way. See, sometimes we don't realize what pastors go through. 
What other position, we can call it a job. In fact, some of you may have read the article I wrote a number of months ago about it's, it's a calling, not a job. What other, let's call it a job. What other job requires that you're in a right relationship with your spouse? <laughs> I know a lot of counselors, marriage counselors, who have been divorced two or three or four times. <laughs> and say, well, I have that experience and I can help. Okay. Um, but he knew he couldn't get in the pulpit without making things right. I was already scheduled somewhere else. I couldn't get anybody at the last minute. We talked and prayed, and he did what was right and made things right with his wife and was able to get in the pulpit. Uh, but that's what that takes. In fact, that's what that verse involves. It's con- confessing to others doesn't mean standing before the church and telling them, I was out with the cows the other day, and the cows did something I didn't want them to do, and I cussed. And I've walked into situations like that, not, not knowing that I was, they didn't know I was there. It was like, oh. <laughs> uh, and I forgave the cow. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but is that what it means we're supposed to stand up and, and hang out all our dirty laundry? No, it's to make things right with the person we offended. We, we, we know we sinned against. We make things right this way. What's that person going to do? We know what God's going to do. He's faithful. He's just. What does he do? He forgives. What's that person going to do? Pow! You don't know what they're going to do. You're take, it's risky, correct? But what are we supposed to do? And if we kept that in mind... That I'm, I need to make things right with God and the person I sin against, it might keep us from crossing those lines. If we kept that in mind, that's the biblical principle. It just might. And to be a healthy sheep and a healthy flock, that's one of the things we need to do. And, and that order, I think, is important too. The psalmist said, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. And the evidence, the proof of that resurrection was that empty tomb. And, and Paul. Um, I don't understand this verse completely. If you do, please, you can help me with this. That I may know him and the power of the resurrection. What does that mean? The power of the resurrection. And may share in his sufferings. I don't like that part. But when are we usually closest to the Lord? Share in his sufferings, becoming more, becoming like him in his death. In that separation. And remember, uh, when we come to know Christ as Savior, we're, we're, uh, we no longer have to sin. We can choose not to sin. Ephesians chapter 4 said, Then will we no longer be infants, tossed, Paul said this, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every word, wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful schemings. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up Grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does his work. He also wrote, when Peter wrote, uh, 2 Peter 3, Therefore, dear friends, since you already know this, be on your guard that so, so that you may not be carried away by the air of lawlessness, of lawless men and fall from your secure position, but grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Okay, so that whole idea of a growing relationship, becoming more like Christ, um, that's incredibly important. And what, is, what does that look like practically? Well, becoming more like Christ in my thoughts, my thought life, in my attitudes, my words, my actions, my priorities. What... what you know, are my priorities square? In light of eternity, is this going to make a difference? Can this impact somebody's life in a positive way? How many of you know John 3.30? I think this is... That's one translation. Here's another, here's another translation. That's not laughing. <laughs> That's he... He must increase. What happens to me? What happens to the I? I must decrease. John said that as well. He must increase. I must decrease. You say, well, 
that's not natural. You're right. It's not natural. It's supernatural. God's Spirit can help us do that, to see, to think about. <laughs> In the old WWJD, what would Jesus do? The bracelet years ago, people would wear. I, I uh, drove tour bus for a while, and I had a group over at uh, volleyball at Gonzaga. And I went in and watched, was watching some of it. And I noticed this one person was, had a WWJD bracelet on. But they were really harassing the ref and not very kind words. And I happened to be sitting, most, many of the students there at, at Gonzaga are Catholic. I was sitting by a young lady, and I couldn't tell if the person that was with the WWJD bracelet on was a young man or a young woman. It was hard to tell, so I, I asked the young lady next to me. She said, yeah, that's a girl. I said, well, what do you think of the way that person's acting? And she, she could see the WWJD bracelet, too. And the response of this young Catholic girl was, she needs to go to Mass. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, yeah, <laughs> probably and then some. Um, so really the, the consequence of knowing and obeying God is that he becomes a greater, greater influence in our lives. And, and what we want is less and less. Um, and th that's, that, that takes some, some time as well, too. Um, John said this in John 13, a new covenant I give to you that you love one another just as I have loved you, so also are you to love one another. There should be love for saints, but every once in a while there's some goats in there too, right? In fact, um, that parable of the sheep and goats in the Olivet Discourse is found in Matthew 25, and there will come a time where the sheep and the goats will be, will be separated, and there can be, sometimes there's the wolves in sheep's clothing, and Sometimes there's goats, and um, you know, is just we just need to image individually make sure we are where we need to be. So, and the point of the parable is that God's people will love others, and it starts with the saints, even those um, with steel wool. <laughs> Some sheep have steel wool. We we admit that. So, and sometimes I have a friend who's in heaven now too. He he all but gave us office space for Eagle Summit for. 17 years, really neat guy, but he's very stoic. He's a lawyer. And uh, in his conference room, he had pictures of wolves all around, all around the walls. And he was the kind of guy, um, it was always easier to ask forgiveness than permission. He was a good godly man. When the people were in the leadership team were talking about changing some situations in the foyer, making some areas off to the side, he was out, he tore down walls before they, <laughs> he was, he just was that kind of guy. Uh, Valley Christian, he helped, he was kind of the ramrod behind the gym and the new building that was there. He just got stuff done. And one day I said to him, Ray, I figured you out. You're a sheep in wolf's clothing. And he gave, actually gave me a smile because <laughs> he knew exactly what I was saying. <laughs> and sometimes maybe we need to set aside that little, that gruff part and, and just let God um, work through us and work through, through the flock. Um, and that, that's, and God can do that. So maybe to be a little more gentle. You know, we all, we all have issues at times. Um, so um, there are those two who, who say, well, we, the psalmist said this too, know that the Lord, he is God, we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Again, the analogy that's, that's carried through there. There are some who say, I can worship alone. I can go out in the woods. I don't need church. Well, the point is, maybe somebody needs you at church. Maybe someone needs your influence it's not what I get. That's our culture. What do I get out of church? No, what can I give? What can I do? How can I serve? Again, overflow from knowing God, loving God, serving God. Not because I have to, not duty, but desire. This is what I want to do. This uh, Hebrews 10, a verse I think we're well familiar with, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and, and good works, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, 
and so much the more as you see the day approaching. That's the day of, of the catching away. In God's, in God's mind, everything has happened at once. Think about that. God's not time bound. We are. In fact, someone has said that time is, is what God established so everything doesn't happen at once. He knows we are time bound and we get kind of impatient at times, but um, there are those who say they don't need other people. That's a sheep. He ran away. I think they named him Gus. He was out in the, uh, I've heard New Zealand or Australia, I think this one was from New Zealand. Six years, he was out on his own. And when they found him, <laughs> he could hardly eat. He couldn't. Um, so, you know, do sheep need a shepherd? <laughs> when they trimmed him, um, they got 60 pounds of wool off of him. <laughs> and you probably could imagine the freedom he felt when he was released from that. But sheep need a shepherd. Um, we all need a shepherd. So this, this whole idea of, of needing each other is important. Now I'm going to show you th this picture. This is a picture of the church with a purpose. The church unified. And we read some verses earlier about this, but it's also in 1 Corinthians, this is mentioned as well, uh, uh, fitly joined together, the body, that image of the church as a body is there in Scripture, all the pieces joined together. Now I'm going to, the, the next picture is the exact same person fitly joined together, but the parts are all messed up. All those parts are there. But it's all scrambled, the same, the same image. <laughs> and what does God want? Okay, He wants the church to be unified, the flock to be together, um, fitly joined together. That, that's very important. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than ourselves. Let each of you look not only on his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. And, and Mark chapter 10. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be president. That's a typo or something here. Must be what? Servant. Servant. Leadership should be modeling servanthood. Be your servant. Whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to, serve, to be served, but to serve. Modeling that character of Christ, to serve. And why did he do that? Even further, to give his life for us. Our life for the ransom of many. That was his purpose. Okay, my sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. Scripture says, how about trusting the shepherd? That servant's heart is also incredibly important that we, we follow through with that. Do you trust your shepherd? Um, one of the things I've challenged with teens a lot with, but I ask them, do your parents trust you? Does your boss at work trust you? Does your Social Security administrator trust you? <laughs> Um, does your president never mind um, if you I tell teens if you have your parents trust you have something incredibly valuable right you lose your parents trust and I'm surprised how many students have been honest and they're like did you lose that trust it's very hard to get it back Okay, boss-employee relationship. Does the boss trust the employee and vice versa? A trust is incredibly important, but trusting a pastor, trusting a shepherd. Sheep learn to do that. And there are there some earthly shepherds who cross lines? Yes. Um, unfortunately, that's true. But you, you have a, a man who is a godly man and wants to lead. Are they going to make mistakes? Certainly. And, and it's... It, 
we can carry, as I mentioned earlier, carry the analogy too far, but ministry is a team effort. Sheep and shepherd working together. So do you trust your shepherd? And why? If you don't trust your shepherd, why? Has he proven himself faithful? Then trust him. If not, why not? And that, that image there, um, just I, it reminded me of the crown of thorns and the picture of love, what Christ did as he hung on the cross. But remember, your, your pastor, there's lots of sacrifices too. He, he probably is going to become very wealthy here. You have uh, 401k and probably have a half a million set aside for his retirement. And you, he gets a free car, right? And free, uh, you're laughing. <laughs> um, but do, do everything you can um, to follow the shepherd that God has given you. That's what sheep do. <laughs> okay, uh, follow the shepherd. We can follow other sheep or follow the shepherd. What's, what do we do? In fact, what happens when in a situation in a church, this person thinks this should happen, this leader thinks that should happen, this person, no, we should do this, this person, no, we should do that, and the pastor thinks we should do this. And What do you think? And I told you men the question to ask. Do any of you remember what I told you to ask? What does God want? Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you. <laughs> what does God want? What does God want us to do? And there are ways to figure that out. And we can sit down together. There's biblical principles to follow. There, there's what you sense in your, in your spirit. God can help us understand there are circumstances. There are things that God will make it very clear. That picture of everything fitly joined together, the unity, that's what God wants. That's the goal. What does God want? And thank you. Not what does that person want. Not what does the pastor want. That person, that leader, that person. What does God want? What does God want us to do? How does God want us to respond? In fact, isn't that a good question to ask ourselves often during the course of a day, God, I really think you want me to slap that person in the face. I, I really believe that would be... <laughs> I really believe they screamed at me over here. I think it would be a good thing for me to scream back at them. <laughs> um, what does God want? And I think that would change a, a lot of our situation. So just, just in summary here again, are you born again? Do you know it? Are you obedient? Have you followed Christ in that step of baptism and, and doing what you know to do uh, as in following Christ in a growing relationship with God? Are you where you should be in your walk, in your daily walk? No two of us are in the exact same spot, but are you where you should be in your walk with the Lord? In character, are you growing to become more like Christ? Okay. Do you have a love for the saints? Well, I'm not sitting on that side because so-and-so sits over there. And there. I mean, there are some churches. I know a church that almost blew apart because a lady passed away, left a significant amount of money, and part of it was to be used for a, a, a new roof. And the church had one of these. It was a building like this with the, you know, the steep roof. Almost destroyed the church over the color of the shingles. And someone asked me, what color did they choose? I don't remember what color they chose. But it was horrible. The, the, the arguments and the people getting angry with each other over... The, and, and who's in the corner laughing? He loves that. He just loves that. Don't let that happen as a healthy sheep. Don't be part of that. God, what do you want? What do you want me to say? What do you want me to do? a love for other saints, and that servant's heart, and to work at trusting the shepherd and following the shepherd as he follows Christ. That's, that's the pattern that God wants us to follow. I don't have anything else. <laughs> if you're here and, and happen not to know Christ as Savior, you don't leave today without making certain of your eternal destiny, knowing that you've received Christ as your personal Savior. It's, it's, it's easy, but it's hard. It's hard because we have to humble ourselves and say, say, but I've been going here for a long time and I can't really humble yourself.
That's what God wants, just to be honest. Father, you know each heart here. I do pray that no one would leave this building not certain of his or her eternal destiny. And Lord, I thank you for these good folks. I thank you for calling Mark and Cindy here. And Lord, we're looking forward to them beginning their ministry here. And Lord, you know, <laughs> there are lots of challenges ahead with the building and other decisions that need to be made. And I just pray as you have worked over many years here with this flock, that uh, through the leadership of the new shepherd, that we would see this many in this community come to know you as Savior and grow in their walk with you. And Lord, teach us what it means to uh, really be a faithful sheep. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, um, that's not what that's supposed to do. You're supposed to sh shut off because, oh, you what? Oh, he told me to shut up. <laughs> um, uh, we're, you were supposed to have somebody else do this, but um, Daryl is not feeling well. Oh, could I read this? The Church of My Dreams. This, I, I edited some of this, but John, John Milton Moore wrote this originally, and I, I changed a little bit of it. A church, the Church of My Dreams. The Church of a Warm Heart, of the Open Mind, of the Adventurous Spirit, open to changing methods, yet firmly fixed on the principles of God's Word, a church that cares, that heals hurts, that comforts the old and challenges youth, that knows no division of culture or class, no frontiers, geographical or social, a church with purpose and passion to know and please God, a church that inquires as well as affirms with confidence, that desires to understand more than making a point, a church that refuses to think the worst first, that responds to the spirit rather than react in the flesh, that looks forward as well as backward, a church of the master and the people where the power of God's love has re replaced the love of power. High as the ideals of Jesus, low as the humblest human, a working church, a worshiping church, a serving church, a saintly church, where God's agenda is more important than man's agenda, a church where the truth is spoken in love, that inspires courage for this life and hope for the life to come. A church of holiness where pastor, I could say where shepherd and sheep, hold each other accountable. A church of the living God. I just thought he did a, a really neat job of putting that together. I'm, uh, Daryl was going to tell you about Eagle Summit. We've had our hands full here recently. Um, Sprague church without a pastor you folks have been without a pastor got a call a month ago frantic call uh, church in dusty near colfax their pastor resigned we have another pastor in town who's facing a kidney transplant uh, he just got hooked up to go on dialysis and he's he's doing okay at the moment but when a kidney's available he found out he has to go because it's through va he has to go through or to oregon or texas and it'll involve two months he'll be he won't Two month, two month recovery, um, and like I said, I was supposed to be at a meeting Friday. I, I got there, but I was late. I have a meeting tomorrow night with, in fact, with that church, um, Pastor Kevin Chin, and their leadership team. So we're, we're, we've been staying pretty busy, and we're just so thankful God's provided a shepherd here and at Sprague, because I told you I have been. <laughs> I'm going to get something mixed up and somebody's not going to be somewhere they're supposed to be. So it is settling down a little bit, and I'm, I'm very thankful for that. Um, do you have any questions of our ministry? In fact, some of you may not know, we, our purpose is to help pastors and leaders of small and rural churches. And often it starts with pulpit supply. But we sit down with leadership teams. In the summer, I'm going to Sedonia with, with um, oh, wow, mugshot. Um, <laughs> Uh, they have a special outreach thing. In fact, I just got a call yesterday. Can you come July 1st? I'm looking forward to that. And we've done a lot of things with that church over the years. Um, uh, it's a community outreach ministry we've done. And Blanchard will probably do that again in August, another community outreach thing. In fact, <laughs> the pastor there, the Sunday 
it was the first Sunday we came, um, I think it was last year, one of the leaders in the church came to the pastor and said, well, that was better than I expected. <laughs> I use Arnold a lot. In fact, I, I used Arnold last, Ar, for, for some of you don't know, he's a ventriloquist figure. He's a wooden-headed character. And some of you, how many remember Arnold? You've seen Arnold, a few of you have. Well, I, I used Arnold, I was asked to use Arnold last week at Dusty, a little church in Dusty, Washington, Country Bible Church. So you may appreciate this. Arnold informed me, I don't know where his sources are, <laughs> but he told me the first balloon that went across the United States. He found out why they didn't, they had to wait to shoot it down over the water. And again, I don't know where he got this information, but he said, it was filled with documents. <laughs> Some of them said classified. Again, I don't know where he got that information. <laughs> He, he, he might be on the most <laughs> watched list now, <laughs> most wanted. Um, and as far as support, you folks have supported us for many years. Uh, I can't remember. I, I know you were in the library years ago. Was there another place in between? Was it the library and here? I mean, the, not the library. The, yes. Um, was it there and then here? A fruit stand? <laughs> I wouldn't tell people that. <laughs> keep, keep that one a secret. <laughs> That's why they're the way they are. Okay, <laughs> we figured it out. Um, we have individuals who support our ministry and a number of churches who's, it's been word of mouth. We don't, I told our board many years ago, we're on our 27th year of doing this ministry. I've always had another job on the side too and, and my wife made this possible as well without her heart, her servant's heart because um, there's some wives who's like, you're crazy. Don't, how are you going to support us? And, but I always, always have had um, another source of income as well because many of the pastors we, we work with are bivocational too, so I get it. Um, so we'll sit, we can sit down with the leadership team. We do creative outreach type things. I can, I've helped with camps and kids clubs. And some people think all I do is kids stuff with ventriloquism and other people don't even know I do that. So um, kind of. We're there to serve any way we can. Do you have any questions of me? If not, I'll sit down and shut up because I think somebody else is supposed to. Who's next? I lost track here. Here we go. I got my sheet. Okay. This is the time. Okay. Now, generally, I always wanted to say this. This is the time to give, and what I want you to do is to ask the person next to you to give them their purse or wallet or checkbook they give it to you, and then you give as you've never given before. And I know you don't do that that way, but I've always wanted to say that. They did that. <laughs> Pat, I think you're next. 